Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the latest installment of our um, actually partially in person um, 65th anniversary uh, Green Bay Observatory Colloquium series. Uh, my name is Jesse Bublitz. I'm a postdoc here at the observatory, and I'm excited to welcome you all today. Um, so, over the course of this uh, talk series, um, we are going to be hearing from experts in various fields where Green Bank Observatory telescopes um, have made sig significant contributions over the years. And so it is my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Phil Jewell. Um, he is uh, not only the deputy director of the NRAO, he's the director of ALMA's uh, North America division, uh, but also a professor at the University of Virginia um, Astronomy Department. <laughs> Still, it's still plenty on your plate. Um, his research focus is on interstellar molecules and how they may be uh, used as chemical boundaries um, for uh, biological life throughout the universe. So with that, um, let's give a warm in-person and virtual welcome. Bill, when you're ready, please take it away. Jesse, thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you for inviting me to be part of the anniversary series. Uh, it's actually a real honor for me, and uh, it's uh, great actually to be back here in Green Bay and to see you all. Uh, it's uh, Green Bay will forever hold a warm uh, spot in my heart, and uh, uh, the people here are so great. And thanks also for agreeing to schedule it in the first week of October, which I always count as the best time to drive over the mountains uh, to, to Green Bay. So I'm going to tell you about millimeter wave astronomy. And uh, this is um, a big topic. Uh, and so I have tried to break the talk into four bite-sized chunks. So I want to start with, uh, as best I can, a survey of what's happened over the past 50 years, really since millimeter wave astronomy uh, got started. Now, this is a lot of territory to cover. And so uh, let me just make the disclaimer right up front that uh, in the 20 slides or so that I've devoted to this part of the talk, you can't really do it justice. But I picked out uh, some of my favorites for this, but uh, please forgive me for not uh, being able to cover, uh, cover it all. Uh, even if I had days, I don't think I could I could do it justice. But part two of this is uh, the story of how much of millimeter wave astronomy actually got started right here in Green Bay, and it's a fascinating story, and it's uh, going to be fun uh, to go through that. I then want to talk about how things, uh, after many years of development in millimeter wave astronomy, things came full circle uh, and with millimeter waves back to Green Bay. Then I'll close out uh, with a little bit about uh, where we're going next uh, in, in the millimeter waves. Okay, so let's let's just go over the headliners uh, first, and uh, these are topics that I picked. Uh, it's certainly not uh, an exhaustive list, but over the past fifty-two years, and I'm going to call uh, 1970 as start as the real start of millimeter wave science. There was certainly stuff that happened before then, but uh, but the real start. So so here's some topics that I have picked out. Um, we defined the gas content and structure of our Milky Way galaxy and other galaxies. Uh, we revealed the chemical content and chemical complexity of our galaxy. We've shown how galaxies evolve from the very early universe onward to the present, and we greatly enhance, uh, enhance our understanding of many fundamental astrophysical processes that include, but not exhaustively, star formation, planet formation, and the life cycles of stars, how they evolve and return their material to the interstellar medium. We have revealed amazing physical phenomena that include things like Einstein rings and images of the event horizons of black holes. But before we get started with that, let's take a little step back in time. What you see in Exhibit A here is, brought, is from my own bookshelf. This is Abel's uh, Exploration of the Universe, second edition, 1969. 
Um, this is what I had my introductory astronomy class from. And yes, friends, I walked with the dinosaurs. <laughs> um, you might also notice exhibit B, the shiny object on the on the, the, the desk beside the shelf beside there. And some of you may recognize that to be a GBT wheel bearing. Now, it's not a good one. And that is, in fact, a whole another story. But let's keep ourselves focused on astronomy for this particular talk. Now, Abel's book uh, is actually a great textbook. I still pull it off my shelf to, to consult on things. And what I'm about to say uh, is not in any way a disparagement uh, of that book, but it was actually just the state of play. Uh, in the late 60s, uh, around 1970. So uh, in Abel's book, uh, which is 700 and some odd pages, there is one fairly thin chapter on the interstellar medium. Uh, and it's all basically what was known from optical astronomy, dark nebulae, uh, reflection nebulae, um, H2 regions. There are three whole paragraphs about how dust and gas condense into stars, mostly just saying, that it somehow happens. Um, nothing much about how molecular gas, nothing much on molecular gas or how galaxies evolve. Now, two weeks ago, uh, Brett McGuire was here uh, giving, uh, giving a talk a part of this series, and it was a wonderful talk. And he told us that the first interstellar molecules were detected in the late 1930s, 1940s, but were con considered mostly a curiosity. And then there was a long dry spell, uh, which basically nothing much happened uh, and uh, no new detections. But then there started uh, a, a rise toward a crescendo uh, in the mid to late 1960s. First with the detection of ammonia, then water, and then the one that we think really uh, broke things open, which was the detection done right here in Green Bank of uh, formaldehyde, which was the first polyatomic organic molecule found in space and demonstrated uh, that there was really complex chemistry uh, between the stars. And then in 1970, in one year, CO, HCO plus, HCN were all detected. CO first by, uh, by uh, Wilson, Jefferts, and Penzias. Uh, Snyder and Buell group detected HCO plus and HCN. And millimeter wave, uh, the astronomy of you know, millimeter, millimeter wave uh, science was really off to the races. So there was really a whole lot learned uh, by the first uh, few detections in, in millimeter wave, uh, of millimeter wave molecular lines. And, it, and it really a lot was learned uh, early on. So uh, some of the first things that were learned is that CO is ubiquitous uh, in our galaxy, and as we later uh, learned uh, all across the universe. We learn relatively soon in this game is that it is a wonderful proxy to molecular hydrogen, which is pretty much unobservable for all practical circumstances. We also learned that these other species like HCO+, HCN, and a whole host of other things are extremely valuable. They are less abundant than CO, but they uh, are also, by virtue of that, less uh, optically thick, and they are probes, uh, great uh, astrophysical probes of, uh, other, uh, of, of other astrophysical conditions. So we learned two things. First, that spectroscopy could explore the chemical makeup of the interstellar medium, uh, but it can also be used as an astrophysical diagnostic. So uh, early days of millimeter wave astronomy was a tough business. Uh, it was great difficulty even making detections, um, but, uh, but they were made. You see the spectrum on the right. That was the initial uh, detection of uh, HCN. And you know, these signals are booming now with present uh, modern day uh, instrumentation. You can detect these in, in, in actually fractions of a second uh, with, with far more signal penalties than that. But by the middle of, uh, of the decade, already uh, the first surveys of our galaxy had been made. So for example, Scoville and Solomon had done uh, a survey of, uh, of uh, the galactic distribution of uh, CO. And by 
and by uh, uh, and by virtue of that uh, uh, molecular hydrogen. Burton, Gordon, Vania, and our own Jay Lockman had done a survey, uh, uh, a similar survey, and uh, really started to trace out what the structure of our own galaxy looked like. And within the next 10 years, we had things that looked like this. And by the mid to late 1980s, I think every astronomy department in the country had this poster uh, from, from Tom Dane, uh, uh, Hartman and Thaddeus, and this was uh, this was a survey that was done with a rooftop telescope uh, at the, on the top of, uh, of uh, Columbia University in New York City. And uh, you might think that that is uh, quite an amazing thing to do, uh, but that was actually an important thing because, amongst other things, it showed that you didn't really have to be on a, on a mountaintop to do three millimeter observing. This was a 1.4 CO telescope. And they took a copy of this uh, down south in the southern uh, in the, 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 the southern hemisphere, uh, and uh, and you can see you can see all the features of the galaxy: the integrated intensity, uh, uh, zero moment is up on the top, uh, the position position velocity uh, uh, diagrams there on the bottom. You can see the rotation of the galaxy. Uh, amazing information uh, on the structure of that. And this only got better with time. So for example, within 10 years later than that, you could see things like this. You could see uh, uh, this was done with the Biologist Telescope and 13CO uh, by a guy that, that you might have run across uh, uh, at, some, at some point in your career. You can see much more uh, definition. And then this particular study was to explore the five kiloparsec arm and uh, one of the things that was found out uh, early on was that molecular material had a, dis dis a different distribution than atomic hydrogen. And there was this concentration and what came to be known as spy kiloparsec arm. And our colleague here uh, was one, one of the people who uh, helped me explore that. Well, the people interested in uh, extragalactic uh, astronomy were not going let to the, let the galactic people have all the fun. So uh, here are the first detections of CO in external galaxies. And there's a couple of things that I want to point out to you about here, uh, about this. Uh, first off, again, the same thing. Uh, look how hard these detections were to pull out initially. So uh, the other thing I'm going to point out is uh, look at the dates and the journal uh, references on this. These were back-to-back -back publications in at J Letters, one after another, and they even have sources in common. So um, this VJ Ricard, Pat Palmer and their team did it. Um, Solomon and Zafra did it. Uh, highly, highly competitive. Everything was just hyper competitive in the early days of millimeter wave astronomy for line detection, source detection, particularly in extra galactic. Um, detections were difficult, but from these heady, but ch very challenging early days, now we can do things like this. So this is a recent, relatively recent observation that came out of the uh, Fangs Alma survey of NGC 4254. And this is done at the essentially the same angular resolution as is obtainable in the optical. And the, uh, this is a composite image between HST and Alma data. And you can see all the sites of star formation uh, just beautifully uh, distributed across that spiral structure. And you can uh, not only do that in one source, you can do it in a host of galaxies. And much is learned by looking at the distribution of this in a host of galaxies. Because you find out that these stellar nurseries, these sites of star formation vary widely. There's tremendous diversity uh, where the star formation shows up. Uh, is heavily dependent on where these things are located and other physical uh, and morphological characteristics of the galaxies. So uh, just astounding uh, where we have come over the course of millimeter wave astronomy. Uh, and this is one of my favorites. This just came out uh, this past summer by uh, Tony Wong uh, at Illinois. This is the 30 Gradus uh, uh, image. Uh, of, of CO uh, from Mag the Magellanic clouds. And, um, and apart from being astoundingly beautiful, there's a lot of information about star formation uh, in this. There's all kinds of turbulence and stellar feedback being indicated in this. 
But one of the conclusions they, they reached was that gravity was winning and star formation was clearly happening here. So there's a lot that we have learned about the universe uh, over the course uh, of, of, of the past 50 years of millimeter astronomy. And so in particular, over the past 25 years, a host of observers using a large number of different telescopes have made mostly CO, some, uh, some carbon-2 uh, measurements, but mostly CO in, in the millimeter way, and, and have characterized the amount of gas mass, mass in galaxies as a function of rich. You plot that up, and you find out that uh, as you go out and redshift, that uh, you reach a point that the amount of gas mass actually exceeds the stellar mass uh, when you get to redshifts of two or three, indicating the peak of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of star formation in the universe coming out at redshifts uh, of around three. And this is uh, tremendously important as we understand uh, the course of evolution of the universe. So uh, an amazing physical tracer. And just to confirm this, and this is again just a, a, a really recent result, uh, this is an image of a grand design spiral, not unlike the Milky Way at a redshift of three. And this um, is a combination of uh, uh, JWST uh, image data. Uh, so, the, so the, the spiral itself uh, is imaged, but there was no information on the redshift. But Alma uh, observed the CO in the object, nailed down the redshift, so we know for sure that it's at a redshift of three. So um, uh, we know, I mean, this is the, the, an example that, uh, that uh, uh, a great amount of star formation uh, happens in, uh, in Milky Way-like structures uh, happen uh, at, uh, at at least redshift of three. Brett gave uh, a great talk about the chemical complexity of the galaxy. Uh, we know that there are over 260 uh, species now detected. Uh, they indicate the path of chemical evolution uh, in, uh, in the interstellar uh, and circumstellar media. Uh, we can uh, use this information uh, to, to trace things like biological precursors. And for many of these species, they are uh, tremendous physical diagnostics for kinematics, for density, uh, and uh, for the structure of, of clouds. And uh, I'm pretty sure that everybody in this room uh, saw that excellent glow limb, uh, but uh, check it out on YouTube uh, if, uh, if you haven't seen it. So uh, I mentioned that uh, in, in Abel's book, there was not a whole lot uh, about star formation. Uh, there, there was certainly theory about star formation dating back all the way to 1902. So uh, Sir James Jeans had put out this theory, uh, basically the, the, the genes instability, the balance equation that says uh, what's, what's the point at which mass, uh, the, the mass of gravity causes gravity will exceed thermal pressure uh, and a cloud will collapse. So that had been known for a long time, but not a lot had been done with it because there was no real observations of mass that was out there. So, you know, how could you test the theory? That all changed uh, when CO uh, was observed. And there was kind of an explosion of theoretical work uh, on star formation in the 70s and 80s. Those of you who were around in that time and going to Globia, it was certainly the topic of about every other global I mean, uh, that I went to during that time was something about uh, the theory of star formation. I'll have to say that the theorists uh, were way ahead uh, of the observers uh, during that time. Uh, even though we knew that there was a lot of molecular material out there, we really didn't have either the sensitivity or the angular resolution at that time to distinguish very much uh, amongst uh, theoretical models, but that has now changed. So look, look at these observations that I have here. These are really pretty new observations off of all uh, of this uh, object in B59. So in this object, if you look on the panel uh, on the upper right, we have symmetric bipolar outflow 
uh, indicated and observed quite nicely here that appears to be very efficient at shedding the angular momentum out of this cloud, uh, which is one of the prerequisites of star formation. You have a rotating cloud, you've got to get rid of the angular momentum from it somehow in order for the cloud to collapse. If you look at the spectrum up in the upper right, you see a, a clear signature of infall uh, in the middle. So you see the material falling back in to the disk uh, of this object. So it's really now possible to test star formation uh, in, in uh, these objects. It's quite, uh, quite amazing. And by the way, this is done with 1.4 millimeter, millimeter trans, uh, transition of formaldehyde. So again, using some of these other uh, species uh, for diagnostics. Everybody has probably seen this. This is the uh, amazing uh, image of HL Pal, a planetary disk. So this came out of the Long Long Baseline campaign uh, about 2014, published in 2015. The reaction that most people had when they first saw this image was that they thought uh, it was a computer model, uh, a simulation, that it was not real data. Uh, in fact, there were some simulations, and this real observation actually, uh, to my eye anyway, looked better than the simulations. Um, so it's an amazing uh, observation that shows how uh, the, the disks around stars and the, the environment of forming planets. Uh, this uh, observation has now become so famous uh, that, that it recently passed a thousand uh, citations and, and its climbing. Such observations of planetary disks uh, are now abounding. So this is the D-Sharp uh, Large Program Survey uh, from Sean Andrews. And uh, you can see just a variety uh, of, of these uh, objects. And we're learning all kinds of things about how planets form. So one of the conclusions that uh, Andrews uh, team reached was that massive planets rel relatively far out in, in, the, in the analogous uh, uh, stellar systems appear to be forming rapidly. Uh, and, and what they surmise is that the formation of these large, uh, the rapid formation of these large planets far out are aggregating and sweeping up the material, which serves to protect the rocky terrestrial type planets on the inside from the bombardment of uh, material of, of stuff coming in. And that allows terrestrial sized planets closer in uh, the opportunity to actually form. This is one of my favorite ones. And this, this was uh, a, a bit early on uh, in AWMA. Uh, this was done by Charlie Shee and uh, Karen Ober and others. Uh, this is, shows the freeze out of material uh, uh, as a function of radius uh, in, uh, in TW hybrid. And so you see uh, the point uh, at which the CO forms and that solid uh, circle that you see there is uh, uh, corresponds to the equivalent orbit of Neptune. And the significance of this freeze out point is that at the point that the gas begins to freeze out on grains, uh, it makes the grains sticky. And when the grains become sticky, then they can begin to aggregate and grow uh, as opposed to actually destroying one another. And that's the, the, the point and the area at which, uh, at which uh, 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 material can, uh, can uh, uh, that planets can actually grow. So here's the other end of the stellar evolution, evolutionary spectrum. It's the death of stars. Uh, the upper uh, figure on the upper right uh, is uh, Aris Octoris. It's an asymptotic giant branch stars. Pre on, we thought that this was just a, a kind of a garden variety AGB star that had a thin, clumpy shell. This observation actually shows that it has spiral, well defined spiral structure. This is interpreted as a binary object that underwent a thermal pulse about 1800 years ago. The object uh, on the lower right uh, is the well known supernova 1987A. And ever since this, um, this supernova went off, there's been a search for the neutron star, which is supposedly at the, at the core, at the, middle, at the middle of this. 
And uh, that uh, hot blob uh, seen by Alma uh, is probably uh, uh, the, the indication of the neutron star in the middle of a uh, supernova event. Behold the ring of fire. This is uh, SDP 81. It is a perfect, nearly perfect Einstein ring. Now, this also came out from, uh, from the early days from the long baseline campaign of Alma. And uh, so it's visually stunning, obviously. And it is a confirmation, beautiful confirmation of, uh, of, uh, of the general law of, rel of uh, relativity and uh, Einsteinian physics. But interestingly, since uh, this came out, uh, there's been a tremendous amount of analysis of this. And uh, people have done modeling uh, of this Einstein ring to uh, construct the, uh, the, 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 the background galaxy. So the background galaxy is the sub dusty submillimeter galaxy, the redshift of three, and the Lindsay galaxy is the redshift of 0 0.3. But uh, from the ring, uh, one can actually uh, reconstruct uh, the galaxy uh, that's behind it. It's quite fascinating. Now, um, if you haven't been uh, stranded on a desert island for the past uh, number of years, you will have seen this. Uh, this is uh, the, the image of the event horizon uh, around Sagittari Sagittarius A star. But this can only uh, be done at the millimeter waves uh, for two reasons. One uh, is that uh, you need to go to the millimeter waves uh, to get past uh, thermal uh, electron scattering. Uh, and uh, which goes as as the as the square of uh, frequency or wavelength. And secondly, when you couple um, uh, the short wavelengths of millimeter waves with a global VOBI network, you can achieve the resolution necessary to do this imaging. So, quite amazing image. Uh, I'm sure we'll we'll continue to see more such things. One of the next things they want to go is, is to continue to increase their observing frequency beyond the 1.3 millimeter range into the, to the 0.87 and 345 gigahertz range. Okay, that concludes part one uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the story. Uh, I'm sure I did not do that justice, but uh, it, it, it certainly has some of the things that I, I think are the highlights. Now let's get on to uh, an interesting uh, second part. And uh, this is the origin story of millimeter wave astronomy. Um, and a lot of it happened right here. But let's kind of start um, at the beginning. So um, let, let's just be you know, quite clear that millimeter wave astronomy was not in any sense invented uh, here. Uh, it's a natural, consequence of, of just expanding to unexplored parts of the spectrum, and many people have the idea to do that. But I, I'm going to say that arguably uh, the, the through line of this development that started here uh, in Green Bank in the early 1960s directly traces to much of uh, modern millimeter wave astronomy. I'm going to tell you the story of this. But I want to credit two references to this. One is the book by Mark Gordon uh, on Tucson operations. And the second is the book by Ken Kellerman, Ellen Bowden, and Sierra Brandt. Uh, much of what I'm going to tell you in the next little bit is taken directly from one or the other or both of those books. Couldn't have done it without it. Uh, and it's really so important that people document these things. Uh, and so thanks to the two both of those teams for uh, the, the work that they did uh, in documenting the story. So um, let, let's be clear that uh, uh, millimeter waves, as I said, is a natural progression uh, from, from meter waves and centimeter waves. There's actually nothing particularly magical that happens when you transition uh, from, from the long, from centimeters to the long millimeters. It's a fairly bland part uh, of the spectrum. Um, but let's be clear that there are some big challenges in going to uh, in going to uh, millimeter waves, and the first one of these is uh, the simple mechanical issue, uh, good old uh, Ruse's equation, um, which says that uh, you uh, if you want to observe a shorter wavelength, you need to have uh, adequate surface accuracy. So, um, and the typical thing says that uh, you, your surface should be something like lambda by 16. That's the typical rule of thumb. 
So just as an example, let's just, just randomly take something that we might call a three millimeter dish. And so uh, these are just things just taken off the top of my head. Suppose it had a 250 micron surface. And let's say that it has a pretty good long wavelength aperture efficiency. You know, the person who built this uh, was prescient enough to maybe uh, build it with an unblocked aperture. And um, if you look uh, at with those parameters out at about 90 gigahertz, uh, wow, it still has an aperture efficiency of about 30%, and it's still a pretty good dish. So, uh, so this would be a, a good dish to do three millimeter uh, astronomy with. But now let's take ourselves back uh, in time uh, to the early 1960s, where we were mostly observing with L band, maybe a little bit of C band, five or six gigahertz. But let's charitably say that you had uh, an X-band dish, 10 gigahertz, uh, and it looked like this. And then, then, you know, you're sitting around the lab and somebody says, hey, let's push this thing up to 30 gigahertz, uh, one centimeter, and see what we can get. Well, you're out of luck because this dish is dead, dead, dead by the time you get to 30 gigahertz. It has essentially zero efficiency at 30 gigahertz. So this is the first obstacle that you have in uh, getting the sort of equipment and instrumentation that you had uh, in the early days. Obstacle number two is this. Now, as it turns out, getting to the long millimeters uh, is not that much of a trouble, not much of a trouble because seven millimeter band, nine millimeter band is relatively transparent. The three millimeter band, um, as we'll talk about a little later on, is pretty transparent, as it turns out, even in Green Bank under certain conditions. It's certainly very transparent at a high side. So I pulled this plot off of the Alma Science portal. This is taken from, uh, from the conditions uh, typical for the Alma site, which is a very, very good site. Um, and you see that uh, it's almost fully transparent there at the three millimeter and one millimeter band, uh, and pretty transparent even at uh, all the way up to the uh, 870 micron band. But even at Alma, you get beyond that, things get very tough uh, and things start to start to tail off. Last one is receiver technology. Well, along about 1960, uh, it pretty much didn't exist uh, for observing in, in the millimeter waves, uh, either for spectroscopically uh, or in continuum. There was uh, a little bit uh, of stuff going on uh, on, the, on the continuum side, which was about the only thing that people were probing. We didn't get around to having a cool shot key receiver with really good sensitivity until Sandy Weinlib and Tony Kerr invented it uh, at NRAO in 1974. Even, the, even by the time we were at 1970 and we had uncooled shot keys, they had equivalent noise temperatures of uh, thousands of degrees, like 10,000. So that's why those first spectra were so noisy uh, that, that you saw. So um, the notion of observing over the entire uh, spectrum is certainly not a new idea. Uh, even back in the 1950s, people were working on this uh, in the Soviet Union. Uh, there was a group at the uh, Lebedev uh, Institute that were working on it. They had an amazing uh, antenna that uh, got adjusted by, uh, by turning 40,000 volts. Uh, uh, thank goodness we don't have to do that. By 1959, they had moved this to the Crimea. It was a better, uh, better site, a better uh, telescope. But mostly everything that they were, that had observed were solar system or planetary bodies. Uh, that's about all uh, that they had gotten to. Uh, there was a, a panel called the Pierce Panel uh, that made a recommendation in 1961 that in, encouraged the exploitation of a millimeter uh, range. Uh, this is all detailed in uh, Ken and Ellen and Sierra's book. Uh, you, can, you can go through this and read it in detail. But staff members uh, here at NREO and Green Bank uh, took up the cause of this uh, very early on. And the person who was leading the charge on this was none other than Frank Drake. This is the same Frank Drake that we have been honoring over the past uh, month uh, since his passing. Uh, uh, Frank was, of course, a pioneer in SETI, 
uh, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. But he was a visionary in many, uh, many different areas. Uh, and this was one of them. And one of the first things that Frank realized is that uh, if he wanted to uh, pursue uh, millimeter wave astronomy, is he needed the three ingredients that I just talked about. You had to have an antenna, you had to have uh, receivers, and you had to have a site. Well, he started out first off uh, thinking about how to get, get a receiver. So uh, he knew about uh, a guy down at Texas Instruments who was working on first generation germanium barometers. And this was um, another Frank, Lowe, that is, uh, who went on to be uh, probably the pioneer in uh, infrared uh, astronomy. So in 1961, Frank Drake flew down uh, to Dallas to Texas Instruments, convinced uh, Frank Lowe that he should come to Green Bank and be a, a participant in the development of, uh, uh, of uh, millimeter wave astronomy. So here's what happened. So right outside, uh, you will recognize that's uh, out there in the back, just in the back of the Jansky lab. So uh, Lowe began his uh, development of millimeter wave development on kilometers. Um, he made some headway on that. Uh, they set up uh, this, this dish uh, out back. Um, Ultimately, they came, they detected, I think they detected the moon. Uh, they wanted to work at 1.2 millimeters. Um, well, Green Bank is actually a pretty good three millimeter site, but, but you're pushing it a bit to get to 1.2 millimeters here. So they came to the conclusion that they should, they, they needed a better site. Now, in 19, they, neither one of uh, these folks stuck around very long. Uh, both in, in 1963, both of them departed uh, MRO. But the seed had been planted at that point, and, and, and other people took up the cause. Um, so, um, so, so the, the effort was underway. And uh, here you see uh, uh, what happened uh, in this story. So, um, in the 1964 budget uh, submission of NREO to the NSF, they just wrote in a request to build a 36-foot telescope. Now, this was back in the wonderful days uh, in which if you wanted to do something new like this, you just put it in. And as Ken describes uh, in the book, uh, that uh, he, uh, Frank Drake just wrote a few paragraphs in and uh, asked for $600,000, which was later increased a bit. But uh, uh, that's how a millimeter wave astronomy and on, on, a, on a pretty big scale uh, got going at NRAO. Uh, and so it went in. Uh, after uh, Drake and Lowe left, uh, the development was taken up by John Finley, uh, who was at the observatory for a long time, and Hayne Bonham, who was the head of the electronics division for a long, long time. And you see the, the dish, there's a whole big story about the dish itself, uh, which is too long to, uh, to relay here, but it's interesting reading. And you can see it was transported from Chula Vista, California in one piece all the way to the, to the top of Kitt Peak, uh, Arizona. So it arrived on uh, Kitt Peak in 1966. Didn't take too long to put it up. It was turned over to NREO in 1967. At that point, that was still before any, any molecules had been detected. So the whole emphasis uh, was, on, uh, was on continuum work. And so, uh, and so that's what it was used uh, for uh, early on until uh, it was upgraded. A uh, tremendous number of discoveries made this with this dish. Frankly, it was not a very good dish for a whole lot of reasons, and so it needed to be upgraded, but uh, that didn't stop it from doing a lot of science. Now, um, millimeter wave astronomy is like a relay race, um, and as, as are most students. And uh, so it's like passing the baton from, from one group uh, to another to advance the state of the art. So, um, NREO did a lot of the early pioneering work uh, through the 36 foot, but uh, that's by no means the whole story uh, of millimeter wave astronomy. There are multiple other groups that really made significant advances, both technologically and scientifically. You see some of them, uh, the Five Colleges Observatory at Plotman Reservoir uh, at, uh, in Massachusetts, the UMass Telescope, 
uh, Millinery Wave Observatory. Uh, there's a nice write-up on that that Paul Vandenbout did. Um, uh, and then uh, the aforementioned uh, 1.2 millimeter Columbia telescope uh, at, uh, at, uh, at uh, Columbia University. Generations continued on uh, in, in the next decade, uh, uh, second and third generations, the Euron 30 meter telescope, Noviana telescope, which operates both the centimeter and, uh, and millimeter waves. Both of those telescopes are still operational. And then the, the, the spectrum continues to move, uh, move up and in the 1990s, early 1990s, both CSO, Caltex, the Millimeter Observatory, and JCMT, and others like CEST, uh, Arizona Observatory, APEX, South Pole Telescope uh, were built. Now, back at NREO, uh, things were, were, were not sitting still. Uh, there were plans to actually build a grander single dish telescope called the 25 meter that was going to go on uh, Mauna Kea. Ultimately, that did not get funded, um, uh, which, was, which was too bad at the, at, at the time. But out of the ashes of that came what was uh, called the Barrett Committee uh, that was convened uh, by the NSF. Uh, members of that were Al Barrett, Charlie Latta, uh, Pat Palmer, Lou Snyder, Jack Welch. And they came back with a re recommendation that uh, the U.S. should build a large millimeter array. So this was based on the sort of combined success uh, of single dish millimeter wave astronomy and, uh, and the success of centimeter waves of the VLA, which uh, by that time, uh, 83 or so, was, was really killing it. Uh, at, uh, in, in aperture synthesis um, uh, in Socorro. And this ultimately became the, the MMA project. And, um, and over the course of the 80s and 90s, uh, the, the baton was actually passed on this while the development was done. Universities were, were really exploiting this concept. And so all of these facilities, uh, Vera, Owens Valley, uh, were later combined into Karma, uh, uh, Iran, Plateau de Beer, Noviana Array, and all of these things, all of these threads finally came together to form AMA, which is, uh, which uh, I think we all know about, was just a, an absolutely sensational uh, facility. Okay, so the through line of this um, is that there are many, many scientific and technical contributors to the success of uh, millimeter and seven millimeter wave astronomy. Um, and uh, there are many parallel uh, developments. Uh, Mark Twain once said that there's no such thing uh, as a new idea. Uh, Mark, Mark Twain really did say that. <laughs> uh, but I think we can make a really good argument that what started with this out in the back there led to this and, and this. All right. Part three, astronomy comes for a full circle. I'm going to start going a little faster here because uh, I want to finish on time. Okay, so let's just talk about technology. There's two parts of this, a little uh, a technology story and a science story. So um, centimeter wave astronomy was, of course, going, going great guns here at Green Bang all through the 70s and 80s. But by you know mid 1980s, uh, the both the, the 300 foot and the 140 foot were kind of 20 years on, and uh, by that point, people were thinking uh, time time to do something new. So um, there's there's kind of a long story that 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 that, that Kim and Ellen and Sierra uh, go through about uh, a, a panel that was set up uh, for a, a national new uh, a large uh, single dish. The optimism that this would actually come to anything was not high, uh, but there had been a workshop that said, better be ready in case something happens. And well, something did happen that we all know the story about. Uh, the 300 foot collapsed and that really changed everything. And so one of the recommendations of this national uh, large single dish telescope was that it be usable at three millimeters. And so that spec stuck in the development of the GBT. And, um, and that all led to this uh, that we have today. Um, so, uh, so we have uh, Argus, we have Mustang, uh, we have all of these things uh, that combined over the past 20 or 25 years. And I really just want to say hats off to the staff. Um, that have just given the sustained effort 
to make this happen over the years. Uh, it's been little by little, there has been slow but steady effort that has uh, pulled this all together. And I want to say just uh, also, just in terms of, of completing the full circle that um, a lot of people within our NRA really took up the cause of trying to make the GDT work at three millimeters. And uh, just, just noting the effort that people like John Payne, who came back from Tucson, worked tirelessly to try to get the laser metrology system going. Ultimately, that didn't go, but I think it, it laid the foundation for things that came later. All right, I'm going to tell a little science story. Uh, this, this started with, uh, with, with the millimeter uh, and ended up uh, at the centimeter, but it's a way that, um, that the story came full circle and was completed. So in the late 1990s, uh, the research group that I was working with, with Mike Hollis and Frank Lovis, we were interested in looking at large uh, biologically significant molecules. Uh, one of them uh, was uh, molecule glycol aldehyde. Now, glycol aldehyde has a formula, the structural formula uh, that you see in the, in the top line, and it can be compressed uh, as written in the second line. And in the parenthetic uh, line, you see uh, C plus H2O water uh, with, with a factor of N. Uh, uh, down uh, at the bottom. So when uh, N is two, that uh, with two carbons, that is a diox. And glycoaldehyde is the simplest possible diox uh, carbohydrate or monosaccharide. There is uh, a debate amongst chemists as to whether uh, true monosaccharide sugars start with N of two or three. Um, this is the sort of thing that uh, chemists uh, face off against at dawn and, and early testings against one another. But that's not actually the reason that we were looking for this. The reason that we were interested in glycol and aldehyde is because it's a member of this family. It's the diose member of N, at, at N equals two. The triose, uh, is, uh, is another uh, sugar called glyceraldehyde. And when you get up to N equals five, the pentose in this family, um, when that is combined with phosphates and nucleic acids, it forms ribonucleic acid, and that is the carrier of the genetic code. And so uh, now, realistically, nobody expects to uh, detect ribose in the interstellar medium. But if you can detect the first couple of these, like uh, glycoaldehyde and glyceraldehyde, you can see the path running for, um, for these biologically complex molecules in the interstellar medium. So we set out to look for this uh, on the 12 meter telescope in the late 1990s. And we thought that the only place that you could detect a molecule like this uh, was um, at millimeter waves in relatively energetic source, compact uh, sources, high energy sources. There was a favorite object uh, towards Sagby T North called the Large Molecule Heimat that was named by Lou Snyder. Uh, only Lou would name a source uh, like that. Uh, and it was thought that that's where uh, you could do it. And so, uh, oh, oh, we detected it. Uh, got multiple transitions, uh, all was good. There was one curious thing about it, though, is that the uh, line frequency came out to be 71 kilometers per second uh, on all of the transitions that we saw, whereas the most typical um, uh, large molecular high mod velocity was more like 64. So that was a curiosity. So um, the GDT gets built. And we want to carry on these studies and see what we can do here. So. Uh, Mike and, and Frank and I come to the GDT uh, in the early uh, 2000s after it, it's commissioned and it's going, and we start to observe it. And um, we, we, we looked at other things. So we, we have a program actually to look for the next member of this family called glyceraldehyde, the next one up. Now we didn't detect glyceraldehyde, but what we did find uh, in this was that. Um, Glycol aldehyde was showing up in absorption. And, uh, and we, we, we saw this in a few other species. And so we were very surprised by this. So, as we all thought, you know, this stuff should come from a warm source. It should all be in emission. 
So what we've learned from this, um, you know, of course, if, if something shows up in an absorption, it means it's in a cool cloud that's in front of a warm source. So it's absorbing the, uh, the, the, the continuum on the source behind it. So we learned that there is a structure uh, in the source of a cool cloud, uh, large cool cloud uh, in front of it. And that star, that uh, really allowed uh, the detection, uh, it, it kind of indicated that these cool cloud sources were, uh, were gonna be very profitable for detection of a lot of these large molecules. Uh, and, uh, and we learned about that from Brett's talk that they have really, uh, this has really taken off in a big, big way Primary survey. So, in some ways, this was this kind of came full circle. All right, part four, the last part. What's next? All right, you've probably seen this. This is the NGVLA. And I want to call attention to this because the NGVLA uh, is a quite amazing project. And you, you, one characteristic that I just really want to point out is that. The most jaw-dropping results tend to happen when a new wavelength regime uh, happens or when there is a huge increase in sensitivity to like a factor of 10 increase. So we saw that when the 36 foot uh, opened up the millimeter uh, wavelength with a reasonably good dish uh, operating at high frequency. Uh, we see that, of course, with Alma. Uh, and uh, a lot of the results that I showed you from Alma were actually early results from Alma uh, that, uh, that just as soon as we had uh, that uh, amazing new sensitivity. But one of the, the characteristics of, of, uh, of the NGBLA, which is, uh, which has this as goal to do milli arc second uh, imaging in thermal sources, is that it will go up to 116 gigahertz and cover one to zero CL line. So it will cover both centimeter and millimeter wavelengths. It's going to be an amazing facility, 244 dishes spread out from core in the Southwest all over uh, the U.S. And one of the key, um, one of the key uh, science goals of this is to be able to measure uh, planetary systems uh, in this terrestrial zone with uh, initial mass functions down to five or 10 Earth masses and in the zone of, of, of around about an Earth radius. So this is something that ALMA can't do because uh, at the frequencies that ALMA observes and the resolutions that ALMA has, the dust is optically thick. So it just can't do it. So uh, just really excited about the potential of this. Okay, well, what about ALMA? What are we doing with ALMA? Well, we're engaged in a, in a project called the Wide Band Sensitivity Upgrade, which is to replace essentially the entire signal chain uh, of ALMA. Now, um, I still think about ALMA as a new facility. Uh, it's only been in, uh, in full, uh, full operation for a few years, but a lot of the stuff that was built for it is uh, 15 years old, 20 years old, needs an upgrade. And so uh, we're replacing everything, uh, the entire signal chain from all the way through the correlators, starting with the receivers, all the way through the correlators, including the data processing. It's actually a huge thing. About the only things that it's not getting replaced uh, are the, the physical infrastructure and the antennas. And um, we're, this is gonna be an enormous uh, boom. You can see with, with the orange uh, plot there, just how much increase in correlated bandwidth we're gonna get. And uh, we're going to have an amazing speed up uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in observing time uh, through this. But we don't want to stop uh, with this. Uh, we want to get that factor of 10. So we're looking ahead at something that we call ALMA times 10. And this is not a project for this decade. We're thinking about this for a project that would come after NGBLA. It would be a project for the 23rd. But we'd like to get the planning of it started now, so the idea is to increase the spectral line sensitivity by a factor of 10 from where we are now. So the, both the technology and the science cases are just very, uh, very um, uh, notional at this point. But here's a couple of examples of what we would do if we had this kind of capability. So uh, this, this uh, image down on the left is a certain planetary disk. So this is a disk around a suspected 
proton planet uh, itself. And the way that this was detected was actually kinematically through uh, the appearance of velocity perturbations. Now, if we could do this sort of thing routinely, uh, that would really be the way to study uh, protoplanetary formation. If you could do kinematic observations, uh, you could see you could see the gas actually swirling uh, around protoplanetary uh, bodies. Right now, with Alma, we're just right on the edge of what we can do um, uh, with sensitivity. But if we had ten times the spectral line sensitivity, um, you you could do this routinely. So that that's a, a huge obvious. Uh, science case. On the extragalactic side, uh, here is an observation of a Z equals nine uh, object uh, and oxygen three uh, that appears to be a rotating galaxy. Um, it is the, the most distant uh, galaxy that appears to have rotational motion. So uh, at a Z of nine, we're appearing, we're starting to see, you know, like recognizable galaxies uh, forming. But you can only do stuff like this if it's gravitationally linked. And um, and we need to, uh, and, but in order to get the, the sort of sensitivity that we need to do this routinely, we would need to be able um, to, to do unknown sources. And so uh, factor of 10 uh, sensitivity improvement would give us there. Okay, uh, here's the conclusions. So uh, I am quite certain that I have not just done justice uh, to, to this. This is kind of a, a lot of material to try to cover in a short amount of time. But, um, but there's, I, I hope I have convinced you of the things that millimeter wave astronomy uh, has contributed to the molecular universe, the star formation, planet formation, chemical complexity, uh, energy black holes. Uh, I believe uh, that we are just getting started with these amazing discoveries. Uh, this has been accomplished by, by the contributions of thousands of astronomers, dozens of uh, observatories, but it all got its start right here. So uh, I just want to say thanks to the people who've been, who've been on my journey through millimeter wave astronomy. Here's uh, Uncle Luke Snyder, uh, my uh, thesis advisor down on the, the lower left. And uh, Tony Rubichon, Frank Lovis, uh, are seeing uh, over there who've been uh, two of my longtime collaborators. And finally, I leave you with an image of the Greenback Telescope in perfect millimeter wave observing conditions, which of course uh, happen every day here. <laughs> Thank you all very much. All right, that was a beautiful talk. Thank you very much, Paul. So at this time, uh, we'll turn it over to the audience, uh, both in person and virtual, for any questions. Um, so audience members, if you have questions, please raise your hand. Um, same goes uh, for those online, unless you'd like to just uh, put your question in the chat and I will read it out for you. So to get things started off, does anyone here in person have a question like that? Jay, really? what? Um, what is the angular scale of that planetary formation figure? Is that like a tenth of an AU or something? Yeah, the one that I that I showed you, uh, the circle planetary disk. Yeah. Um, let's see if we can take a look at that. Yeah. So uh, the the, the fiducial there is is one arc second, and they didn't uh, on this particular plot they didn't put a beam size, but uh, I suspect they did that in a long baseline mode, which uh, which gets down to. Uh, uh, several tens of milli arc seconds uh, resolution. So I'll look it up in the paper for you. I don't know if I'll buy it by All right. Any other questions here in person? Nothing online just yet. Go ahead, Ryan. In the panel with all of the different um, protoplanetary disks, it looked like some of them had some sort of like spiral structure. Or where it wasn't just concentric rings coming around, but there was some sort of outflow or something like that. Um, is yeah. that so what does that do to? Is there actual like density waves being excited similar to in galaxy that gives us? So, so um, I, I will be on thin ice myself to tell you uh, exactly, but there are theories uh, of, uh, uh, about the extra potential explanations. 
Some of them involve the presence of, uh, of uh, other bodies. A lot of these are in multiple systems uh, that, that might cause that. Uh, and others you know, might be density waves, clumps, and so forth. Um, but like I'm saying, don't, uh, you might want to ask an expert. <laughs> Yeah. So it looks like um, someone here is asking, do you think that the NGVLA has the potential of protecting any of the amino acids that are basically glycine or maybe I'm getting it wrong, or alanine in the amino acid part of the Well, we always uh, hope that that is, is true. Um, um, you know, I think, I think Brett talked about this a little bit in his quote you know, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, a complexity that we learned, um, and I was involved in, in glycine searches a couple of decades ago. Um, the thing that is really hard about glycine is that uh, it comes in what's called two, two primary complements. Its abundance is split, uh, distributed across those complements. Uh, it uh, often uh, the, the most probable trans transitions are also in extremely crowded spectral uh, areas. And it's difficult to pick the lines out uh, from other confusing species. But there are techniques that one might use uh, uh, to, um, uh, to try to pull it out. So I think as sensitivity increases, um, there's it, there, there are molecules that are um, already uh, have more atoms and are potentially more complex that have been detected. So um, it, it will probably be detected. Hey, and, um, do you have a question, Jay? Just a comment that there's an interesting side channel historically that connects millimeter astronomy to the GDT, and that's the Bell Lab 70. Because that was a telescope that was doing millimeter astronomy, but was the first, I believe, offset parabola used for astronomy, radio astronomy. Thank you for bringing that up. And I should, uh, that was really an omission on my part, not include the Bell Labs telescope in the, uh, in, the, in the survey. And that's a really interesting highlight. So thanks for mentioning that. You had mentioned kind of asking the when expect to see ribose. Um, I think that was the N equals five. Mm -hmm. exactly. um, is there a physical reason for that, or is it more of a technical limitation? And if it's a technical limitation, like what would it take to detect something? So it, it's it's merely a case that as a molecule is get to that level of complexity, there's uh, a lot of reasons why, but uh, both abundance reasons uh, and. Um, it's difficult for them to survive. Uh, both uh, they can, can get broken up by a lot of different ways: UV collisions, um, and the the more complex they are, the harder it will be for them to survive. But the thing that um, motivates us is not so much that we have to find the full chemistry of life in an interstellar cloud. You know, all, 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 all the way to you know a life form, but we need to find the building blocks of life because we know that in protozoa nebulae that um, there's all these these we have comets and, and so forth that that uh, have collisions with uh, with Earth-like bodies, and if they're loaded up with uh, relatively large building block molecules, then you know that's how uh, that's how life uh, can get seen. What about the GDT and its potential for contributing to three millimeter astronomy? What's the next step for the GDT? So the, there's two or three things that I think are um, tremendously um, tremendously big opportunities. Um, the always, you know, so so there are a lot of three millimeter dishes around, but there's no hundred meter. Uh, three millimeter dishes uh, around. Um, so um, I think more and more we learn the value of angular resolution. So if you couple um, if you couple uh, the sensitivity of the GBT, some with large focal plane arrays, and the fact that you get the angular resolution of a hundred uh, meter dish, 
then uh, you can uh, do you can do observations of these star forming regions uh, and you know really uh, get detail about you know, the sites of star formation and the detailed small structures without losing any of the total uh, intensity uh, information. So I think that's where uh, the, the GDT can contribute. And I think it's it's both spectroscopically and uh, and then continuing uh, through through these waters. All right. Well, uh, there are no more questions online uh, presently, and uh, if there are no more questions from the audience for right now, um, we're a little bit past the hour. So thank you all for staying with us. Uh, and with that, let's give uh, one final round of applause. Thank you very much for attending, and please remember to join us next week, where we'll be virtually um, talking with Dr. Tom Bania about uh, radio recombination lines uh, here at Green Lake Observatory. Thank you very much. <laughs>